Yeah, fuck Phil Collins. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I on your side, Del Toro. Take him down. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are tonight's entertainment. Saget? Yes, sir. I know who I am. Did IQs just drop shot? I could have been. I, I, been. I have a plan. I like this All shit. Is. Is All is. It will. You know, it's Dance it's off, bro. It is your Me and destiny. You. <laughs> Welcome to the Atlantic Screen Connection Podcast. Let the games begin. Hello and welcome to the Atlantic Screen Connection Podcast with Jason and Lee. I'm Jason. I'm Lee. And today we're going to be talking about The Devil's Backbone, mm-hmm. a film that was directed by Guillermo del Toro. The movie came out in 2002. And Lee, before we get into this, what did you think of the film? Just an initial reaction uh, before we get into uh, like taking this one apart, because there's a lot to unpack. Yeah, I thought to me, like, I wonder how I would have felt. Had I not actually been watching this film, trying to break it down for the sake of the show, you know, that's, that's, that's something point. that uh, that unfortunately is it wasn't wasn't at my benefit. This is my first time watching the film, although I have watched it a couple of times trying to get my head around it. And I would say I, I am really positive about it. it. It's a really well put together story. It's not like particularly like any story I've ever seen. At the same time, it's kind of difficult to discuss. You know, I, I, maybe that's me, but I feel like the narrative is so open in its interpretation that I spent the first week and a half after this film just scratching my... I got, I got real fucking... Like, almost like a stroke trying to piece my head around it. I don't know. Like, I, for some reason, I caught on to like the wrong threads uh, each time I went back to look at this. I kept catching on to something... And I went down this whole rabbit hole about the political discourse of the time, so I booked up on the Spanish Civil War. God help me, I don't know why. And it's good, because now I'll be able to tell you tell you the Nationalists apart from the Republicans. But, like, other than that, the story isn't really about that. It's more like a contextualization for the story and a lot of the themes that play into it. But it's not a particularly straightforward tale in, in much of any no, way. Right. And I think... It's hard to describe how an audience who aren't looking to break it down would walk away from this. Just the looseness of the narrative. Yeah. And I think that comes from the fact that, um, well, as I've, I've seen read, that this was a very personal tale to Del Toro. Uh, and obviously it comes from something he specifically felt and wanted to say. And so that, from the outsider perspective, which is everybody else watching the film, it might be a little difficult to piece together exactly what it is we're supposed to really get out of it, other than our own experience. Oh, man, yeah. And it, it, was yeah, a, it was a hard one. It definitely wasn't easy. And that's, no, that's I it. relish the challenge, but I also can't say definitively that I wa- I'm walking into this going, yeah, you know what I nailed? Devil's Backbone. Fuck that film. It's mine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's kind of nah. that 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 depletes the the confidence a little. But uh, I'm still, you know, it, 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 I, I'm really looking forward to discussing the film. I, and I agree with you with everything you just said because. I, I, this is the first thing I, I told you when we, when we started talking about that. I was like, I, I don't, I'm not 100% confident in my material. And mm. I did a fuck ton of research on the, on the film and uh, the take that I was headed towards. And I really had to watch this film twice to appreciate it and then have to go back and rewatch snippets. And, and I was like, I, I can only kind of sympathize with the people that are like, this is a really great film and I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know I mean? So. <laughs> and, but at the same time, I mean, it's one of those movies that, uh, now that I've seen a couple of times, I, I, I'll feel like every time I go back and revisit it, I'll find something new inside. Yeah. It it's really one of those things like that, that I can just dig and dig and dig and dig and I'll have something really interesting to talk about. Uh, that being said, as I said earlier, I mean, uh, there's a lot to unpack. And as you said, it's so open to interpretation that, I mean, you gotta, yeah. if it's personal to El Toro, sometimes you, like I was telling Leslie this morning when I was talking to her, I was like, if it's this personal, why did he make it a mystery so difficult <laughs> to unravel? You know, what's, what's, uh, you know, I don't know if there's a conceit there. And I, I, uh, I know Del Toro is a really smart guy and I, he's probably sick of being told that he's a really smart guy. This is a really smart film. I love the way it is, yeah. you know, and so we're, mm-hmm. we're walking into this whole morality tale again. Uh, we have, uh, the, the themes of guilt and repression that are there as well, you know. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, it's very gothic and I'll get into that a little bit. But at the same time, you're like, 
dude, why don't you just tell me what you'd want to tell me? <laughs> why make it this fucking hard to understand? And I think that there are different levels. It yeah, depends on how far you want to go. That's the thing. Like a lot of people will refer to this kind of film as a mood film more than a story film. You know, they'll try. Right. He's trying to impart on you a expression that isn't particularly narrative, but more just a longing, a feeling of the depression of a of a of a space and time that all kind of weighs on you while you watch a story unfold, and that, that works for some people more than others. And so I would totally understand when people go like, oh, I love it. I don't know what it's about, but I love it. Because it's more it's more like the feeling of being there and, and following these characters in that moment. That's, imp- that's more important. I am almost certain that was more important to Del Toro than trying to get across a shitload of symbolism and story and moral messages and stuff like that. Stuff that we've come to see in a lot of his films that are kind of more straightforward to understand and have at least a couple of angles that are far more pronounced than others. This one just feels like everything's on a level ground where you could pick that part and, and he'd go, yeah, that's in there. And then, yeah, then, but you know, it's, it's not, it's not, there's not one big overall conceited message, you know, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, there's, there's positive themes in there, you know, it's good for you. You, you got one. <laughs> I don't know. I feel I feel like sometimes I um uh I'll be honest, the first time I watched the movie I was like, "Oh no." <laughs> That's right. Yeah, now you, I, now you, I, have... I remember you saying you texted me he's like, "I don't know if I like this film." <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for that is because it se- it seemed to like be standing its ground and say interpret me and I was yeah. like, "Fuck you. Uh, don't do I'm that." Busy. Let me... <laughs> <laughs> I have work I to do, I, man. I have other exactly. films to watch. <laughs> it must be the the time of the year right now. The fact that I'm I'm starting to be surrounded by snow, and then the the end of the semester is coming, and I'm like, oh no, I picked the wrong time to start thinking about yeah. this really, really interesting film. And I'm like, I'm so lazy now. Christmas <laughs> is coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I think that's more important to impart to the audience so that, you know, the stuff that we'll bring today, it's kind of like we're, we're picking at some stuff that we think is is worth you hearing to help you kind of wrap your head around the film if you have no basis on, on understanding the film. And I think that's something that, you know, we're just throwing ideas into the pot to make sure that, you know, we all have a starting point and somewhere where we can go down for further discussion. But this is a film that just keeps giving, you know, and, and you know, for one, for one conversation that will go down, there'll be a hundred conversations we're not having and we kind of just have to, to plow through and, f- and not lose track of the fact that uh we we have some things that need saying and then you know if maybe this is one we'll push out to the twitter followers and the people like if you watch this film and you're hearing something but we're not getting the message that you're getting from those same images then you should get in touch with us and talk about it because it's it's that kind that, of film <sighs> Yo creo que he visto uno. Aquí. ¡A clase! ¡Vamos! ¿Qué es un fantasma? Ayúdame. ¿Quién suspira? Un evento terrible condenado a repetirse una y otra vez. Quedan diez lingotes más. No tienen padres. No tienen a nadie. Están desesperados de hambre. Mira cómo comen. ¿Qué ves ahí abajo? Algo muerto que parece por momentos vivo aún. Un granito de fuerza. Un granito de fuerza. Un sentimiento suspendido en el tiempo. ¿Y el fantasma dónde está? Llegó con la bomba. Como un insecto atrapado en ámbar. Vivís siempre pensando que había un tiempo después. No hay más tiempo, Carlos. No hay un después. Essentially, what I wanted to talk about first, okay, I mentioned a ghost story, and I think that this is a ghost story. Mm -hmm. And because Del Toro is usually preoccupied with the gothic, everything that we've seen, like uh, Cronus has some sort of gothic in it, uh, mimic, you know, you could basically say that those little, the bugs or anything like that are somewhat 
gothic in nature, even the the what we're using, the liquid and all that kind of re- goes back to Alien, which was also a goth- gothic horror picture from '79. Uh, even when we're going to be going throughout the other films that he want that he, that he's doing, Blade, vampirism as well, uh, Hellboy, you'll have that traveling through time, demons and whatnot. Uh-huh, uh, you definitely. know, even in Pad's Labyrinth, you know, you get the the monsters that are in there, the fairy tale imagery and all that. It's all very very gothic and i'm pretty sure that the shape of water there's probably a, an abundance of liquid and long hallways and stuff like that that just are going to be there, but I seen... <laughs> it's a shape of water <laughs> yeah just a touch <laughs> you know but in Cr- crimson peak would be the one that, that that's his crowning jewel in terms of gothic horror if yeah, you will definitely so i figured that in preparation for this discussion i would read a couple of things and i found one essay that was really interesting uh that was written by ellen brinks and it's called nobody's children Gothic representation and traumatic history in the devil's backbone. Lucky that. Brinks <laughs> has a definition of the Gothic that I really, really enjoyed. Mm. Uh, she says that because the Gothic is a genre concerned with how uh, a repressed or denied past intrudes into the present in an unwanted fear inducing guise it is a genre well suited to explore the continuing effects of traumatic history whether individual or collective and so i thought that was really cool Definitely. the fact that he has it during the civil the spanish civil war setting would be the collective um i'm going to be focusing a little bit more on the individual i'll show you i'll talk about that a little bit later brinks his thesis like i said focuses more on the collective and she says this this is what she wants to talk about in her essay it's uh the devil's backbone as a gothic film rewrites Spanish Civil War history in respect to its traumatic impact on intelligibility uh, to a coherent sense of self and to the possibility of catharsis and closure which is really interesting I had a fun time reading this one yeah. so what she basically talks about is what she calls the multi-generational trauma of the Spanish Civil War and how del Toro uses uh, the orphan kins to show how uh, politically divided Spain is during that period and what those effects have on future generations. But with that in mind, as I said, she focuses more on the collective and I really wanted to focus on the individual in the devil's backbone. And even though Carlos is the first kid that we see in the film, my focus, the individual that I chose is Jamie. Yeah. Uh, and Jamie to me is the main character in the film. He's definitely the one with the, 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 the strongest narrative backing. Like, I, well, I'll be talking about some Carlos related stuff. I was curious as the mystery as to why the camera lingers with Carlos half the time, but I think you're definitely right that uh, the, the, this, when this when we're talking about the, how this story impacts a character or individual, Jamie is the individual that we should be focusing on. And like I said, I mean, because Del Toro uh, focuses on the Gothic and how Brink says that the Gothic is uh, how a repressed or denied past intrudes on the present. I feel like be- this is Jamie's story because he's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder following the death of his friend, Santi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that seems to be jumping to a conclusion, but at the same time, I'm going to build on that in order to show how Del Toro explores that little thing that's going to lead us to a, a surprise revelation. At the end. <laughs> <laughs> so to get to the post-traumatic stress, I want to uh, first cite some research that I made regarding trauma and recovery in times of war. And I took this from a Judith Herman from, well, it's actually titled Trauma and Recovery. So <laughs> it's her research basically that she had done on that. So uh, here's what Herman says in her introduction. And so I quote, she says, the ordinary uh, response to atrocities is to banish them from consciousness. Certain violations of the social compact are too terrible to utter aloud. This is the meaning of the word unspeakable. Atrocities, however, refuse to be buried. Equally as powerful as the desire to deny atrocities is the conviction that denial Denial does not work. Folk wisdom is filled with ghosts who refuse to rest in their graves until their stories are told. Murder will out. Remembering and telling the truth about terrible events are prerequisites for both the restoration of the social order and for the healing of individual victims. I'll continue. Uh, The conflict between the will to deny horrible events and the will to proclaim them aloud is a central dialectic of psychological trauma. People who have survived atrocities often tell their stories in a highly emotional, contradictory, and fragmented manner, which undermines their credibility and thereby serves the twin imperatives of truth-telling and secrecy. When the truth is finally recognized, survivors can begin their recovery, but far too often secrecy prevails and the story of the traumatic event surfaces not as a verbal narrative, but as a symptom. Hmm. Uh, Notice how Herman says that folk wisdom is filled with ghosts who refuse to rest in their graves until the stories are told, murder will out. 
I mean, this is clearly Santi that we're talking about. Uh-huh. Um, you know, Santi is most certainly a fucking ghost. <laughs> and I'll be getting into a little bit later why the other boys are somewhat ghost-like as well. Uh, because they can roam around the, the building while the, the adults uh-huh. are kind of busy doing their weird affairs and all that. Um, mm. I think that a lot of this has to do with the uh, the corruption that adults have. And I'll be getting into that a little bit later as well. But as yeah. I said to me anyway, this is Jamie's story. Like mother, you know, Aronofsky's mother, I think that the orphanage can be seen as a representation of Jamie's mind. Yeah, right. And I think that maybe given the fact that PTSD kind of plays on that, the repressed memories and, and, and whatnot, I think that a lot of these events could be happening inside Jamie's head as well. Right, okay. And so I think that if we look at how Jamie, you know, or how the movie can be broken down, I think that Jamie's trying to heal the psychological trauma he's experienced. Uh, and that leads to a repressed memory, which is the death of his friend Santi. And as such, I think that the orphanage kind of becomes a prison, you know, a place in the middle of nowhere. There's no escape until Santi's murder is outed. I feel that that's the, the, the weird part, you know, when we'll lo- talk about the imagery of the, the, um, at the end of the film, which is kind of a liberation, if you will. I feel like the film finishes yeah. on a positive note. Um, sort of an ambiguously pro- positive, but positive enough note. <laughs> yeah. But what I want to do right now is I want to cite a little bit more about what Herman says about PTSD uh, in situations where soldiers have been held captive. Herman believes, and I quote, people in captivity become adept practitioners of the arts of altered consciousness through the practice of dissociation, voluntary thought suppression, minimization, and sometimes outright denial. They learn to alter an unbearable reality. Ordinary psychological language does not have a name for this complex array of mental maneuvers at once conscious and unconscious. Perhaps the best name of it uh, for it is doublethink. And this is where Orwell's definition yeah, comes in. Orwell in there. Uh, so, uh, and I still quote, uh, doublethink means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. The person knows which, in which direction his memories must be altered. He therefore knows that he is playing tricks with reality, but by the exercise of doublethink, he also satisfies himself that reality is not violated. The process has to be conscious or it would not be carried out with sufficient precision, but it also has to be unconscious or it bring uh, with it the feeling of falsity. Even in using the word doublethink, it is necessary to exercise doublethink. Herman continues, The ability to hold contradictory beliefs simultaneously is one characteristic of trance states. The ability to alter perception is another. Prisoners frequently instruct one another in the induction of these states through chanting, prayer, and simple hypnotic techniques. Mm -hmm. In addition to the use of trance states, prisoners develop the capacity voluntarily to restrict and suppress their thoughts. This practice applies especially to any thoughts of the future. Thinking of the future stirs up such intense yearning and hope that prisoners find it unbearable. They quickly learn that these emotions make them vulnerable to disappointment and that disappointment will make them desperate. They therefore consciously narrow their attention, focusing extremely on limited goals. The future is reduced to a matter of hours or days. Alterations in time sense begin with the obliteration of the future, but eventually progress to the obliteration of the past. Prisoners who are actively resisting consciously cultivate memories of their past lives in order to combat their isolation. But as coercion becomes more extreme and resistance crumbles, prisoners lose the sense of continuity with their past. The past, like the future, becomes too painful to bear for memory, like hope, brings back the yearning of all that has been lost. Thus, prisoners are eventually reduced to living in an endless present. Now, as I said earlier, I think that Jamie's suffering from PTSD and that Santi would be Jamie's repressed memory. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the beginning of the film, by rubbing the blood on his hands and on his face, I think that Del Toro is saying that Jamie feels guilty for Santi's death, even though he's innocent and isn't the murderer. To me... That is a form of double think. At once knowing that you're innocent, but thinking that you're responsible for a murder you did not commit. PTSD is described by Herman as essentially being reduced to living in in an endless present. So in that case, what I thought is that the orphanage is a place where every day is exactly the same for Jamie once Santi dies. So... The opening of the film suggests that by lowering Santi into the water, Jamie's burying the memory of Santi deep into his subconscious. And I'm borrowing that because when we talked about Blade Runner 2049, the whole water discussion we had with Carrie Lynn, she told me that water was the uh, was also symbolic of the subconscious. So I'm reusing it here. Yeah. So I think that when he dunks Santi into the 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 kind of 
pond or the pool of water that's underneath, that's the moment where Jamie actually begins his endless present. And so I also think that the children in the orphanage are conjured up by Jamie because they're images of the past that help him fight his isolation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Every little child that's there could actually be a figment of his imagination. And I know this is like, this is really pushing it. This is really reaching, but I feel like those are all past memories of what Jamie uh, could have been they could have been a future memory of hope but at the same time he's suppressed and rejected them and therefore he's always standing kind of aside he's not necessarily friends with them or anything like yeah. that and so mm -hmm. i feel like they are those conjured up uh memories or images of they, a past and they definitely see him in at least in this sort of if this is in his mind and he is either himself or a, an avatar version of himself similar there you to go exactly how javier bardem functions in mother then it, the positioning of him as a bully in this orphanage kind of makes them all subservient to him and they avoid him so it kind of does play with the idea that these are fractures of him and therefore they don't really touch him or approach him in any way exactly well and see i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about that a little bit but first i want to get to um what carlos represents mm -hmm. to me carlos is the thought of a potential future and oh god <laughs> the one that will hurt him the most <laughs> not necessarily hurt him the most but i think that it would be I, what i'd consider jamie's innocence returning you know what right, i mean okay. that one uh -huh. fleeting thought of the future if all the other ones are repressed thoughts the ones that he's that he's using to choose to fight his isolation carlos is one of those that could potentially become a, f a past thought one of the other children that are there you know mm -hmm. what i mean yeah and right so okay. i think that at the beginning carlos is a restricted thought which uh, is why he's alone in the car being brought to the orphanage that, yeah that yeah okay. it explains it, it works quite well because yeah obviously um jamie does try to bully him just like he bullies the other kids exactly so That's therefore he's trying to position him into sort of something beneath him or behind him or within the past under his control so that makes sense exactly it's like I mean, it's like the prisoners keeping their their the the thought of the future to a day at the most aha uh -huh. So cool. I'm glad that that's following up because even the way that the shot is set up at the beginning of the film, you know, you'll have the, the car that's traveling from left of the screen to right of the screen. And usually if you're talking about that, it's something that's leaving the past and going into the future. Okay. So we have Carlos heading towards his future, but at the same time, this is a future that could be a possible return to innocence for Jamie if we use Carlos as a potential version of hope. Okay. And so by bullying him, mm -hmm. um, Jamie tries to suppress and restrict the future that Carlos represents. Yeah, to help okay, him function so it's basically, day to day yeah, within exactly. his own subconscious. That makes sense. Yeah, and so, I mean, as time passes, if you look at uh, the things that kind of bring up Santi and in uh, Jamie's mind, you'll have things like uh, Carlos uh, collects slugs. The same thing that he used to do with Santi. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also the fact that bed 12 stays empty until Carlos occupies it once he arrives. Um, and so I think that all those little things... Uh, you know, uh, what, 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 how could I put it? it um, just leaving that bed empty is Jamie kind of, uh, keeping inside his mind the potential for hope, a potential of return to innocence. Someone yeah. that's going to come and take Santi's place. Yeah. I mean, there's even the idea that they share a passion for comics. But the, com yeah, the way that. Jamie views comics is that it's almost like a future career for him, an outlet that he can look forward to. So the idea that one of the things that they share is something very specifically set in how Jamie's going to develop later on in life yeah. kind of feels like that also rings true to the idea that Carlos is something that means future and escape for him. So that, that does, right. I, I see that. And what what other movie did we see that in this year? For somebody who looks forward to the future? I have no idea. Lo Logan. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> look at Laura! Laura, the, yeah, the yeah, idea that she's the, seen the, the comics is that she's to going Canada. to eat it, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so absolutely. the thing is, what I'd posit right now to you is that I think Del Toro is saying that Carlos and Santi are doubles, right? Okay? okay. So the idea of like a return to innocence as opposed to continuing to live in in sin, in a way, I'll bring that in right now. The idea of innocence and sin is, is very prevalent. You know, the idea of guilt and repression and all that. This is yeah. all very Catholic imagery. When I got mm -hmm. when I was watching Devil's Backbone, I was like, oh shit, okay, here we go, religion again. Here, here, here we are again. <laughs> <laughs> <For fuck's sake. laughs> Uh, and also what I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, the shot that we're introduced to Carlos, uh, to me was really, really interesting is the fact that we have the car traveling through this giant wasteland, you know, a complete lack of fertility, the complete lack of growth, dead wheat everywhere. You know, it looks like the soil's been burnt. So nothing seems to be growing and there's no room for growth at all. So 
in that sense, if you look at it, there's no past and there's no future. This is always what it's going to be. So we have the imagery of an endless present there as well. Uh, Carmen says that the earth is so dry and the air is so hot that the dead get stuck halfway to heaven. We have Santi there who's stuck in some form of purgatory as well, the Uh limbo that you were talking about, which is essentially a translation of that endless present. And the way that the shot is set up, you'll have that uh, screen that is divided in two. Uh, which to me suggests a division between heaven and hell. Again, sure. the place between innocence and sin. And I feel like the best image is that of the orphanage in the middle of the screen, which suggests, again, the limbo. And because of the remotelessness of the place, I think that that means that that place is stuck in an endless present. Even yeah. just look when Cochinta tries to leave the fucking place. She says, I'll probably be able to make it. But you can see that it's going to be one of those long slogs. <laughs> to have to travel through a desert and hope to be okay on the other side. Now, the idea I want to knock again, I want to knock home the idea of an endless present. Uh, Herman says uh, that the future is reduced to a matter of days. And the setting for Devil's Backbone, uh, as expressed by Brinks uh, in her uh, essay, she says that the setting itself is over a course of a few days. Right. Yeah. And so if Jamie is to break free from his endless present, you know, that guilt that he feels in concealing Santi's murder, he must embrace Carlos as uh, the hope for a better future. And he has to act at that moment in time. Now, I wanted to quickly get into the aspects of double think because I'm leading this to exactly where I want to go. And I think that the first idea of double think that we're looking at in The Devil's Backbone is how the orphanage is perceived, okay? Yeah, right. Now, if we look when we see when when Carlos sees Santi's ghost for the first time, I notice that Del Toro uses uh, a reaction shot from inside the building where Santi was killed. And the screen is dark all around the edges, okay? And it kind of looks like a keyhole. Okay? No, you're totally but right. Yeah. One of the doors is closed and the window makes it seem as if there are bars on the door. When you compare it to the other one, which is completely open. Mm. And so we can see in that shot how the orphanage can be seen both as a prison, but also as a place of freedom. Yeah, right. Uh, what I noticed is that Del Toro also uh, reuses the uh, a, a keyhole shot when Santi's chasing down Carlos and Carlos locks himself in a linen closet. Yeah, he looks for the keyhole to, to check for Santi. Is that the case? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, 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 and I, I knew it was coming, mother, I, but I jumped so fucking much when that little <laughs> eye showed. I'm like, you fucking. You're that, jumping shows, this film? Uh, oh, man, I jumped. I, I, I'll be honest really with you. You really are bad with even the faintest idea of harm. Oh, my God. Oh, but I, but I listened, dude. I had trouble sleeping. I, I saw Santi all over my apartment after that. What the fuck? <laughs> I know. Kid. He's like a I blue know. kid. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so that's it. I think that by placing that, the, you know, having the emphasis on, on keyhole type imagery, I think we're meant to think that Carlos is the key to uh, Jamie's innocence. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what I think that Del Toro is getting at, and this is just me, is that children are more resilient than we get them, give them credit for. Okay? Right. Yeah. And that they're not responsible for adult sins, adult failures, and greed. Because those are the big things that are going to be coming out. Jacinto is greedy. You know, Carmen is, is a sin to a certain extent as well. And you'll have Cesaris that also has sin. Now, what does this all mean? Why are we talking about PTSD and playing with the innocence and sin? And I think that what Del Toro is doing is he's Taking on Genesis. Yeah, fuck Phil Collins. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I on your that... side, Del Toro. Take him down. <laughs> <laughs> I think that specifically what he's talking about uh, is the idea that we're all born of sin. Okay? Now, at a young age, we're all told to believe that children are innocent. That's what we're told. They don't know any better. They're just doing things. But religion says that they're all born into sin. Yeah, definitely Catholicism as well. <laughs> but that's, that's the weird part is that, you know, to me, that is what the ultimate double think is. To walk around knowing you're innocent, but how are the powers of authority telling you that you're evil and full of sin? Uh, yeah. You're kind of living with that your entire life. It's like, I didn't do anything, but yet apparently I did. <laughs> you know, but those are the sins that have been passed down through Adam and Eve. You know, and so I thought that was a really clever way of looking at how religion shapes the mind and it tortures you into thinking or it, 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 my, well, to me, it look, it boils down to this being a traumatic thing. 
mm-hmm. the fact that you're accused of something that you didn't do. It goes to what Hitchcock had lived through with his father as well. The same thing is how Jamie feels about Santee's death. He feels like he's a bad boy. He feels like he should have acted, but it's not his responsibility. The yeah. people that are in charge of that place should have taken care of Jacinto the way uh, before anything would have happened. They knew what kind of person this was. And so, I mean, original sin, I had these quotes. I took out uh, Genesis 821 and it said, uh, and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. So now we have that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I also Thanks, have God. one from <laughs> Thanks God. I have one from Psalm 14, 2 to 3. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together, they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. And so you have that in scripture where wow. God is just this motherfucker just looking down at you and saying, oh like, ah, they're all talk, shit. You want to talk about fucking double think, you know, that this guy created something necessarily exactly. evil to look back on this guy and think that this guy is something good. <laughs> and that the, at, the, at the same time, if you break down everything else, I mean, to me, what Del Toro is showing is just how corrupt the Garden of Eden is. And this is supposed to be an example that we're following constantly now yeah. when i looked at the film and i noticed that you know the the, the whole uh, orphanage was in a, this remote place it's supposed to be a safe haven for these orphans but at the same time it's a place of sin the same way the garden of eden was and so that's what i think that del toro is getting at in the entire film the weird thing is uh, i feel like this film ends on a positive note i feel like doubling back and repeating the voiceover from the beginning of the film but uh-huh. with one minor change is that there is a hope for a better future and The film opens with this, what is a ghost? A tragedy doomed to repeat itself time and uh, time and again. An instant of pain, perhaps. Something dead which still uh, seems to be alive. An emotion suspended in time. Like a blurred photograph. Like an insect trapped in amber. And you're like, look at that. Isn't that, aren't those all symbolic of an endless present? I mean, that's the the thing. The constant recurrence of of limbo in this anyway keeps bringing up the fact that this is an endless present. The actual, Mm -hmm. like, the bomb itself is almost an imagery for purgatory. It's an actual limbo water that forms the uh, the title Devil's Backbone. Ah, but that's it. I think that the whole movie is that, is that Carlos is that one, that hope for a future for Jamie. And once Jamie is able to absolve himself of what happened to Santi, and accepting that this is a potential future that he can have and return to his innocence, then he'll have kind of not necessarily suppressed any form of PTSD he might have had. But the fact that children are resilient, the fact that children don't have to live with these sins, and the fact that religion kind of, or well, I'll say Catholicism for what you said, basically, you're, you're not supposed to make kids feel guilty at a young age. They're not supposed to have to deal with what adults are going through the corruption yeah. of adults is on them it has nothing to do with children and children should not <laughs> be caught in the crossfire with regards to those things so jamie's ptsd is not his fault you know i yeah, I, I really think that you know that that whole imagery with the blood on his hands and on his face you know that's him basically saying this is my fault you know i'm a bad boy i should have done something about this but it wasn't his to be done they should have known like i said earlier that jacinto was trying to steal that gold he's a greedy motherfucker yeah i mean and that's interesting because that's that's when you look at the individual you're obviously you're seeing a world that's more positive to the extent that you actually look at this as if the actions of the adults can but in this case doesn't entirely corrupt the children yeah. but if you kind of look at the collective it feels more like it does corrupt the children and that the ambiguity of the ending feels counterintuitive to that struggle that we're seeing with Jamie because I mean when I was looking at the collective we, I, we were looking at the idea that it might be something of a cycle and I guess again that kind of leads us to where we were starting with mother you know because that's where we sort of tried to base her her work off that it was sort of an incremental cycle this yeah. case it was sort of what we were discussing was that um their experiences here as orphans with their home torn apart by gold leads them to escape via the desert a path led with gold we were looking at that that greed you know uh and uh, you kept mentioning it throughout this and it definitely the, the main drama of the film spins out of jacinto's greed at the very least and in turn the children we were, i was kind of thinking they renew the cycle of greed as they mature with a mindset to seek their own fortune and it becomes something of a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy and that was kind of something i was left with because i was thinking like perhaps that greed that underlies the film is commentary on the the political climate of the time you know that kind of fits yep. with that nature i mean 
There's the hiding of the gold by the Republicans that were given at the start of this story. And, you know, if you actually look at the historical sort of side of things, there's a hoarding and abuse of gold by the, the government at the time, the nationalists. Right. And that belies the corrupt nature of the adults as well, who sell the rum to the town despite knowing its lack of properties and who hoard the gold. You know, so we, we've got this idea that they are in themselves greedy because they are hoarding that gold for the Republic. And But then I'm also looking at how it bleeds into the thoughts of the children, such as Jamie, who dreams of treasure. And, and when he talks about his comic books... Yeah. And he talks about an adventure with treasure, which is what this story ends up becoming. Uh, but it's also a, an insight of what drives him, you know, as a person, what he thinks is going to be the real world, or, or at least what he wants out of life. The ultimate gain is treasure, you know, and that comes from an experience of potentially being impoverished. You know, you're being an orphan, you might want, you know, you're going to go out there, you're going to make a name for yourself, that's obviously going to be sort of the way to do it. Uh, but you know, the, the fact that that trickles into his mindset, we kind of have to see if Del Toro is asking us to consider maybe how much greed corrupts and distorts our essential humanity. Right. I mean, we ingrain greed as trauma in t- and so push it on to kids. And those kids, in turn, are possessed to aspire to wealth in the same way that Jamie embodies. So we kind of... I was thinking about the limbo of that, and I thought that greed in itself is a sort of limbo. And right. that's interesting because that's that parallel between what you're saying is an individual story for Jamie versus the collective story uh, with all the kids together in this place. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I'm saying about the frustration of how open ended the the <laughs> imagery is. You know, yeah, man. When you're walking away thinking that these kids are a hope for the future, and then also the next step in a in a chain of similar steps where they grow up to be adults who fuck over kids. And I mean, adults do have to come from somewhere. You do kind of have to think like, well, these kids, we can call them innocent now, but you know, someday they're going to grow up to have to be responsible for their actions, and we're never going to get to see these particular kids grow up right. and be responsible for their actions are the events of this story pushing them in a direction that we can see is going to be a positive one as mm-hmm. a collective whole and when we kind of look at the events of this and the central idea that it all revolves around gold and they were poor kids and they're going to step into the Spanish Civil War in this ambiguous exit through the golden sands <laughs> to the future I-, I couldn't help feeling that there was a little bit of despair at the at the cyclic nature of it all yeah but I mean look at going both ways again you brought up the gold Old, right and i mean if we look at like del toro's sensibilities with uh, morality tales and fairy tales and whatnot gold is usually like a payment for something of a good deed so jamie in in trying to gain that innocence back you know and trying to get gold he sees that as being a payment for being a, a good boy you know what i mean looking yeah, off uh-huh. for treasure but in the film when you look at it and then it's transposed onto jacinto that's where it becomes the image of greed Right. And so again, Jamie is forced to see gold in two different ways. At the same time, you see it as, you know, this, this, well, if I get gold, then I'm doing something good. But then Jacinto is a bad guy and he gets gold too. How the hell does that work? You know what I mean? So it's yeah, a so traditional that's, that's, idea. There's your uh, double think right there. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> the, you know? the concept of gold is exactly a contradiction. You know, bad people who have all the gold and yet you all need gold to survive. So you're right. going to have to work for bad people. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's that you know the, you know that's something we all have to face in life <laughs> absolutely right so yeah i mean the constant embodiment of limbo is entirely the takeaway for the film you know like it's it so readily gives you something and kind of snatches it back from you one way, like, I, way i looked at limbo i looked at limbo in the film as something to do with the invention of man because that was okay. something that that was really exciting to me it was one of the discussions between carlos and cesares and that tied myself into trying to understand understand how Carlos fits into this story is where invention fits into the story based on their discussion. Right. And so I, I came to it at one point and it kind of ties into the themes that you've been, you've been bringing up is that one of my reads of the film, one is sort of a smaller one, is that we can look at those who find God as those who are in a way lucky. <laughs> okay. Because while the film en- might end badly, and by potentially following God, it might end badly, at least <laughs> those who follow God can find some way through life. So it, the way I saw it was, like the limbo water that houses the children dead from the devil's backbone, the orphanage is a place that houses the lost and abandoned, both physically and emotionally, so it becomes a limbo in itself, complete with its own metaphor for purgatory, which is that bomb, as I mentioned, and right, the limbo right, right. and a tank of yellow water, which kind of drives back the, the idea that it has its own 
well of limbo within itself so th- to me it wasn't so much a psychology but it was in itself a place that is akin to purgatory mm-hmm. and so i like to imagine that all these characters in the story are in purgatory and that means they are without god essentially they are stuck in a place okay. between god and the, the devil or hell or whatever the fuck you believe So they are stuck between the position of faith and lack of faith. And the orphanage pretends to be religious to pass as a nationalist allied Catholic school, but the people are stuck between both advantageous Republicans and the threatening nationalists. So that that kind of drives home that idea to me. So back to that conversation between Carlos and Cesares, they're talking about the limbo water. And I mean, talk about fucking double think. Fucking Cesares' reaction to this is is as double think as it gets. (laughs) The, um... The people who drink it believe it cures them, but to believe that would be the same as to believe in ghosts. All superstitions and inventions are equal here in that they are all invented by man for someone's purpose. Yet, when it comes to it, Cesaris does drink the limbo water despite knowing it's simply rum. So, like, that's double thing, selling it knowing it's useless (laughs) and still fucking drinking the fucking thing. He obviously yeah. has to convince himself there's some sort of a vector reason to do so. so. That's right. He takes that swig and, you know, he sees he hesitates on it first and then he just chugs it down. Exactly. Yeah. So I guess through that discussion with Carlos and Cesares, we're given a scale of those who have faith in invention. And it's not a judgment of those inventions, but rather a look at the contentment of those who believe in them regardless. And that's what we're getting from the swig is that that double think can help you get through uh, a limbo <laughs> exactly, <laughs> to some yep. degree, and that there may be various degrees as to how far you can get with that. Yep. So Carlos believes in the ghost, equate it to the rum. He never stops believing in the ghost. He gets scared away from that conversation, but it, he, he still believes in, in Santi's existence. So he follows its words, and it leads him to safety. He convinces the boys, and they all follow suit and escape with him. So the adults then refuse to acknowledge the rumors of the ghost, and so are left behind to die. And Jacinto is motivated by escaping the purgatory, and he intends to do it by gold and violence rather than honest reasons. And so the ghost ends up killing him, you know? So we get this sort of scale. Those who believe in the ghosts get to escape. Yep. Uh, they can move on from the place. If, if this place is limbo, then we can see the ghost as their faith in God and their escape is a uh, move towards heaven. Mm-hmm. Those who do not believe in the ghost are left in purgatory to fight and die, even if they were superstitious. You know, you need faith. You, you go whole hog in the faith. You can go to heaven. But everybody else, we're just making our waves in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the, the world beyond the orphanage is not a perfect place. It's a limbo all to itself, a war zone. And th- that's what we've been discussing already with the idea that it's set in the civil war and it's the right. desert. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean when you get to heaven, it's it's all sunshine, rosy, you know, fucking everything's working out, Garden of Eden. No. Uh, it's, it's a fucking desert. So <laughs> you don't know what's beyond the desert. But one can at least leave the orphanage if they trust the ghosts. So for the kids, it's all too easy. And so right. that's that impression. We're even getting a the commentary there on how easy it is to get children to believe in God. And that's why we get that push for children to be indoctrinated in God that kind of ties in with the original sin. Like, you wash it out of the kids, you know? It's almost like a like an incentive, you know? Get your kids into God early because they're born dirty. Yeah, and look at the two guys that bring Carlos to uh, the orphanage in the beginning of the film. You know, that could literally translate as, as two priests. You know, that are actually That's, re- yeah, it's recruiting true. children, you know, <laughs> and ju- yeah, exactly. the fact that Jacinto is also one of them, that he knows those two guys, mm-hmm. then you could basically say, well, look, Jesus Christ, priests are people that we were told we could trust. And at the same time, Jacinto is kind of like one of those guys and he's he's evil, you know, and so another example of, of doublethink, look at everything that came out, even with the keepers this year of priests molesting children and all that stuff. And you're like... What the fuck? Why am I being told that these people are people I can trust when they're actually evil fucks? You know what I mean? I'm not saying that the two guys at the beginning of the movie are evil or anything like that. But at the same time, you're saying that it's easier to recruit children because, you know, their their brains are, you know, they're, they're more accepting of the supernatural, if you will, than, than an adult that's going to look at it and exactly. say, like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> well, I mean, that's exactly it. Because, I mean, if we look at Cesare's, who he wishes he believed. You know, if we look at his ability to drink the water, that's him 
attempting to convince himself that it's yeah, a possibility, you know, like at least. That. And that's that where that kind of double thing comes in, you know, you're, 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 you're convincing yourself of against exactly what you know isn't the case, and, <laughs> and, and it's a contradiction in your mind. So, and he wishes he could leave that way and steal the courage he's always required. That's the discussion they continue to have, is that why can't he leave? Is right. that he, don't, he lacks the courage, and you could read that as he lacks the conviction to be faithful, you know? And that's That could be weighed up from the fact that he himself is in a world that is you know surrounded by the spanish civil war you've seen the horrors of war it's hard to continue to have faith in a in a world that also has a, a benevolent god overlooking things when you've you've seen horrors like that so his inability yeah. to leave the orphanage is pretty much his inability to side one way or the other in whether he's a religious man or not because of the stuff he's experienced already being through life and that's Ties in kind of with his age as well. He's seen shit, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> but, definitely. Uh, he's too, he too is he's aware of his superstition, but he can't buy the invention of others, and that's that's what he believes ultimately God is, and so that's why he can't leave. That's he is a ghost by the end, and he is stuck to haunt the halls of this purgatory that he's invented for himself because he's never getting out of fucking purgatory. <laughs> no, man, he's not. You're right. And I mean, ultimately, the film is envious of those who can believe in God. Uh, for they can escape the minefield that is a place of abandonment loneliness violence and superstition i mean that's not a place you want to be the desert looks fucking better than the orphanage so yep ultimately we're looking at a story that frames a place that that envies a war zone you know so <laughs> that faith therefore that leads these children out is better than dealing with or at least easier than dealing with the fact that you have to live in a world with abandonment, loneliness, violence, and superstition. <laughs> and, and, and it is kind of true. It's entirely true. Yeah. You see, the pe- people who are religious, they don't have to they don't have to deal with this shit in the same level that people that aren't religious are, because all this stuff, this is all we got. <laughs> you know? Yeah. If you believe in a heaven, someday you're out of here to you, you know? So you don't have to you have to close your eyes, you can turn around, you don't have to worry about the fucking world you're living in. But for the rest of us, that's kind of all that is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's it. Uh, from here, it, it looks like escape. The power of innocence and belief makes that escape possible. It is easier to move on in life and not become trapped by the inner workings of the mind if one believes in God, even if it is an invention by man or superstition. Yeah, and I mean, on, on invention, this is this is where, this is the rabbit hole I went down, you know? And it's, right. I, I, I don't know, I guess when I thought invention, I was thinking God just because that's where I my head goes. But another thing, and this, this is a rabbit hole that I ended up cutting short because it was never <laughs> going to end. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to be talking about communication, and I, I want to explain beforehand that I got there by analyzing invention as one of the five tenets of rhetoric, uh, okay. or the art of discourse. Uh, inventio, or the creation of arguments, is the first tenant and, and drives the remaining four. So I'm going to be talking about how Carlos deals with invention, and how we look at that particular individual in this story, right. uh, and what that might mean. But I want to, I want to express that I, I went, I got here from a very weird angle, and... I, I I was trying to work in something about rhetoric, and that was all. It was all coming across very confirmation biasy. You know, it was very much like I will make this work. God damn it! Uh, <laughs> and it was I had to cut it dry and just go like, no, no, right, reassess, look at the facts, and let's try and make something out of it at least. So here's here's another here's another understanding of invention in this story, and it's that whether you understand rhetoric or not, the world is always violent. And that's, it's, again, it's just one take, one read of the film. But I mean, Devil's Backbone might be a statement on an outlook on diplomacy. That all it can do is limit the amount of violence in your life, but at some point you're going to have to get your hands dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, man. That fits in with Jamie, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Except, you know, it's, it's pretty fucking bleak as an outlook in, on, on life, but it also can't true. So the idea relates to the notion of human invention again. And once again, I feel centers around the discussion between Carlos and Cesares, uh, as well as the main cast and their ability to communicate with one another. So let's look at invention. The conversation between Carlos and Cesares relates to how human invention is used to cope, as we were discussing earlier with the idea of trauma uh, and double think. That double think is a coping mechanism when you have two uh, contradictory ideas you need to move forward anyway. Human invention in this relation becomes a coping mechanism and explains away the science behind the devil's backbone. That people are drawn to myths and stories rather than reality and will often double down on that 
then try to face that reality. So even though the scientist in the story, which is Cesare, concedes right. with his drinking of the rum that reality is perhaps even too rough for him, we get the idea that he may be impotent due to his focus on the side effects of the rum. And either way, he drinks the rum. So we know, even though he knows it doesn't have any effects or a greater property, because he too would rather believe in ghost stories than the world he lives in. Right. However, and again, it relates to that idea, Carlos still believes in the ghost. So he still believes in ghost stories. And the inevitable reconciliation with Santi by the end of the film allows him to lead the children to relative safety and escape the orphanage after the attack by Jacinto. Right. So this unreality can, in fact, help people confront the world out there in some form. So what's left? If Cesare believes in myths and dies for it, Carlos believes in myths and lives, what separates the two? Ultimately, I argue that it's Carlos's ability to communicate with others that helps him mitigate the danger and lead the other children. Something that the other characters in the story lack, because... Cesares cannot tell Carmen that he loves her. And Carmen cannot admit to her affair with Jacinto. Jacinto keeps his agenda secret from the orphanage and misleads Conchita. Conchita hides her affection for Jaime, or Haim or Jamie, and Jamie struggles to communicate with Carlos, bullying him before eventually coming to understand him. Santi, as well, can only attempt to communicate with Carlos, but he is ignored by the other boys. So you see that everybody has, in one way or another, a, a, a character flaw of communication breakdown. Nice. And Carlos however, is very forward with his feelings and thoughts. Rather than flee and keep secrets from Jamie, he confronts him until Jamie relents and becomes his friend. He maintains mm. a confident relationship with Cesaris and the other boys, and shares his possessions with others because he feels confident enough to do so. Carlos only fails to communicate briefly with Santi, which leads to the destruction of the orphanage, as if he had listened, he would have been able to make that difference. That's what Santi's trying to tell him, you know, you're all in great right. fucking danger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Carlos's relationship with Santi becomes symbolic of his ability to communicate, as well as his ability to believe in myths. And having both traits makes him the ample leader for the scenario, ultimately leading the revenge plan on Jacinto and helping the other boys escape. He can navigate life more efficiently than the other characters because not only can he express himself, he can also blend fantasy with reality and still achieve results. Nice. So it's it's interesting because the film does make a case for the diplomat having a stronger hand in mitigating anything life throws at them, but this is the Spanish Civil War, <laughs> a communication breakdown of a setting. Right. Oh, yeah. Man. When the people rebel against those who can't speak for them, the country is separated and forced to fight for its survival. Uh -huh. And what happens to the kids? Even with their diplomat, at some point they are forced to take action, leading Jacinto into a trap and murdering him. So, the film feels like an admission that, yes, the diplomat has the strongest hand in life, but that ultimately, without action, they can never succeed. And without violence, they can never win. So, okay. the escape into the desert, one in which the Civil War is taking part, uh, but is at least on the edge of collapse... It becomes a poignant admission that real life is not made of moral victories and high roads, but of compromise. And ultimately, okay. the film, a blending of real life history and fantasy and fiction, becomes a parallel admission that life is one big grey area, and the future is admittedly bleak and violent no matter how you manage. Right. And so that's my kind of, that was like, that's where rhetoric took me, what the fuck? <laughs> That's really cool, man. I really like that. Uh, you know, the lack of communication leads also into the the uh, the uh, restriction and suppression that I was talking about in terms yeah, of yeah, absolutely. You know, the fact that these guys can't necessarily communicate. And I love the fact that you know you're bringing Carlos into it, and the fact that he can actually blend those two worlds together. You know, I think that plays in nicely to what I said also about the fact that this is a future innocence that Jamie can have. Mm -hmm. Only for a certain time before Carlos is going to be corrupted. You know what I mean? That, yeah, that pretty much. little window is very <laughs> narrow for him to believe in those things before he gets taken in by what the orphanage is supposed to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, that's good. I love that. Anyway, anyway, before we close this out, I wanted to get into this. I had a couple of other things that tie all this to religion. Uh, the number 12. The fact that Santi's bed is number 12. Right, okay. Like the apostles. If you look at, uh, yeah, well, there you go. If you look at a mythology or even the, in the Catholicism, you have the 12 apostles, you have the 12 months in a year. Uh, in the Bible, 12 is considered a perfect number. 
as it symbolizes uh, God's power and authority. Uh, other fun little asides <laughs> is that there are uh, 12 names in the Bible that contain only two letters. Right, okay. Um, this is part of the little dumbass research that I made on this slide. Uh, <laughs> Jesus, oh, this is a fun one. Jesus in the Bible for the first uh, speaks for the first time at the age of, you guessed 11. it. 11. <laughs> 12. <laughs> 12 and uh, a half. As and Jesus funny, would have uh, said at that time. <laughs> Uh, one other thing that I picked up on uh, is that the number 12 is actually uh, it appears 187 times in the Bible and that's funny that uh, 187 is the uh, the uh, code for murder for police so I don't know if that's seriously <laughs> holy shit <laughs> <laughs> man you know I, I, I recently watched Pi and I feel like I'm in that film now it's kind of like, like number theorist <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but and just to close out the the, the idea of number twelve, twelve. Uh, if you put one and two together, uh, it evokes the Holy Trinity. It's three, right? And we talked about mm. three in terms of fairy tales, how it's a recurring thing of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. You know, and so you have that. You know, the idea of completion when it comes to that. Another fun thing that I checked out is what Santi means. Santi in uh, Hindu means peace. Uh, right, okay. And so at the same time, uh, that's another way of double think. If you look at his name as peace, but he's living in purgatory, the fact that his soul is not at peace. At peace you have all, that yeah. that dichotomy <laughs> there as well. And I also broke down Jacinto. I did a little bit of research on that. Good. And Jacinto is actually uh, derived from two places. So if we stick with the Bible. Uh, Jacinto is derived from Jacob, as in the grandson of Abraham. Mm. And the etymology of the world is uh, one who follows on another's heels or a supplanter. The fact that he's trying to take over from Caesar or Cesaris, sorry. Cesaris would have liked to be Carmen's lover, but he's not. Jacinto is actually the one. So he's the yeah. one who follows on the heels of. The second place is the hyacinth flower, uh, which has a variety of meanings depending on the color of the, the, the flower itself. Uh, because the film's color palette is somewhat of a warm yellow and the fact that Jacinto wants gold, which is the yellowish color, mm -hmm. uh, the hyacinth in this case means jealousy. But jealousy is not the way we use it because I want to go back to the Bible again. <laughs> uh, jealousy in the Bible means demanding exclusive worship. Uh, so if because Carmen refuses to look at Jacinto while they're having sex, that makes Jacinto into a figure of jealousy. He wants to be worshipped. And here's an example of how jealousy is used in the Bible. In Exodus 20, uh, 4 to 5, it says, You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. <laughs> <laughs> I actually and did so, know that quote from somewhere else. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, there's a lot of religious imagery in there. I didn't bother to look up what Carlos meant. Uh, Jamie is either or Jaime, I should say. Uh, I, I didn't look at those. I thought, you know, I'd just pepper it out with regards to uh, what I was looking for. But yeah, so that's it for me. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add to the whole thing, uh, Mr. Lee Brady, sir? Have I said enough times that this is really open and hard to read? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah man I, I could have anyway <laughs> I don't <laughs> must Here's not open other breakdown. can <laughs> <laughs> must not open other can I, that's it for me I don't have anything else I can't go Great. on me either good work <laughs> so good shall work, we team. close this out sir let's do it <laughs> alright so thank you again you guys for tuning in to uh, our second part in the uh, Guillermo del Toro retrospective with the devil's backbone, we hope we did it justice. Like we said, like many times throughout, we're we're not we're not unsure of our material. It's just that it's so there's so much literature. I mean, when I was going through the uh, the, uh, the, the like the research that I wanted to do, I I have so many essays that I didn't have time to get to. Like I said earlier, I'm boiling down to the end of my semester right now, so I wanted to read a little bit more. But I'm I find it fascinating, and I will read uh, a little bit more on uh, the devil's backbone because there are so many stones that we've left unturned. Yeah. Uh, there's just and so you much just, going you on. Just, you just know it as well. As we go through this retrospective, we get to the next films. We're going to be constantly harking back. Oh, that's in Devil's Backbone. Oh, back there's yeah, that's exactly. in Devil's Absolutely. Backbone. You know, Double yeah. Fink is clearly something that's going to be haunting us for the rest of this fucking retrospective. <laughs> oh, just, just look look at the end of Pan's Labyrinth. But oh, anyway, yeah, but God. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you have to play a trick on yourself. But we'll leave that for that time. You know, and I think that mm -hmm. this this is really I, now. I really want that Criterion trilogy here at home because with with 
Cronus with Devil's Backbone and with Pan's Labyrinth. I mean, these are all sister pictures. They're talking about very Absolutely. deep themes that Del Toro really loves to delve into. And I did notice a couple of things that are going to be coming up in our next discussion with Blade 2 and, and the Hellboy films. Uh, it's going to be really, really good. So anyway, where can we find you online, sir? Yeah, you can find me at Lee Paul Brady on Twitter. And uh, you, that's it. I mean, if you want to contact me directly, I mean, there's Lee Paul Brady at gmail.com. But yeah, just hit me up if you got some thoughts on, on all that rhetoric crap and we'll <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> Jason. <laughs> You can find me on Twitter at Jason B. Michael and be sure that you're following the show at Atlantic SC. Head over to Facebook to like our page. Even if you don't like uh, stuff on Facebook, do us a favor. We like you. (laughs) Follow us on Instagram as well at Atlantic SC Podcast. I want to thank everyone who's been tuning in uh, to our latest. Our discussion on Justice League did far better than we thought it would be (laughs) because of the (laughs) fact that we were highly negative on the film. But anyway, that's it for us this week. We're guys, we're going to be coming back with something new soon. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye.